Welcome to the context. Today I want to talk to you about open source and why it matters so much in our fight against COVID-19. Open source is a concept of freely sharing information, knowledge, abilities, skills, designs, freely, not necessarily in the sense that they shouldn't be paid, but in the sense that it is legally permissible to transmit this knowledge in a community that is becoming ever larger. This has been the case in many ways in communities that would need to defend themselves and that could understand that they would be strengthened by this sharing of uh, the information. Certainly, we have not always understood that uh, this would be uh, possible or desirable. The alchemists would die in experiments that could be avoided if they would have had the ability to learn from the examples of other alchemists trying to transform lead into gold but not sharing their mistakes. In the 70s, with personal computers being born, there were clubs with passionate people trying to put them together and tinkering with uh, scarce documentation, uh, but very uh, creatively in uh, these machines that uh, had a very modest uh, functionality. Uh, they couldn't do much, but it didn't matter because learning about them was what mattered instead. And so learning and sharing this uh, uh, knowledge is what would naturally be going on in these clubs. The documentation uh, would be improved and the programs that uh, the computers uh, could uh, run exchanged both on paper, because often you had to put them in each time you wanted to run the program, uh, and I am mimicking uh, the keyboard uh, with my hand, but sometimes these computers wouldn't even have uh, keyboards. You had to manipulate uh, sequences of switches in order to program them. There was, in particular, a, a young um, programmer who was very passionate about uh, computers and uh, uh, one computer model popular at the time called Altair. And he convinced a, a friend of his uh, to design a programming language for uh, the Altair. Uh, a visual basic, uh, not a visual, a basic interpreter. There was nothing visual about it because it was actually stored uh, on uh, perforated the tapes. And, and that is how the computer would learn how to understand the other programs that were written in uh, the basic language. Altair was headquartered in New Mexico. So from uh, Boston, the two friends uh, drove uh, in the 70s to New Mexico and were uh, hired to uh, actually uh, run this uh, uh, program and they successfully delivered uh, it uh, to, to Altair. Uh, the, the two uh, guys were uh, Bill Gates and Paul Allen, and they formed Microsoft at the time with an uppercase M and an uppercase S. And they were uh, incensed when they realized that uh, uh, people all over uh, uh, the U.S. had uh, formed these clubs, and uh, when Altair uh, in turn would uh, arrive at those clubs, uh, the various owners uh, of the Altair kits, after assembling them, would uh, exchange uh, the perforated tapes, uh, duplicating them in order to be able to run the basic language and the programs on top of the basic language. Bill Gates wrote an open letter to the community to please stop this because uh, the software industry couldn't uh, be born and couldn't blossom if uh, the intellectual property 
of uh, uh, the software developers uh, uh, were not uh, uh, respected. Uh, there are many types of intellectual property, as it is called, in a, it's an umbrella term. Copyrights, patents, trademarks, um, and uh, also there is a, a, an important and interesting way to protect uh, uh, one's uh, uh, ideas, the industrial secret, because the society in exchange for the protection that uh, a patent gives you for 20 years, anybody um, incorporating your invention protected by a patent uh, in something else uh, is either in violation and can be sued for damages or must come to an agreement with you and pay royalties. In exchange for this kind of protection, uh, society uh, wants to see that the inventions and the creations are flowing and, and uh, delivering benefit and value to society at large. Now, copyrights have been uh, notoriously uh, extended in the past decades. If originally it would be conceivable that uh, an artist uh, would say, I am so glad that I have the copyright uh, protection for my art because that is what feeds me. If uh, nobody were compelled with the force of law to pay for my song or my movie or, or a, a poem or a novel that I wrote, uh, I would uh, not be able to feed myself. However, today, copyright uh, lapses uh, 75 years after the death of the artist. So are we sure that these are incentives that are benefiting society? Do you believe that any artist will say, no, I'm sorry, if copyright protection doesn't last, so that my great-grandchildren can also benefit from the poem that I am writing right now, I'd rather put down the pen. It doesn't matter how it burns inside me, this passion of creativity. I will resist uh, giving uh, the opportunity for it to burst out and uh, to be embodied in the poem because I find it intolerable that after I am dead and my children grow up and their children grow up, their children don't receive the royalties of the poem that may or may not be a masterpiece. Because obviously, as I'm writing it, I still don't know. So I think we can say that, uh, that copyrights are at least a little bit broken. Now, what simultaneously with the birth of the closed source software industry was happening is that also an open source uh, software movement was uh, being born. Originally at universities and research centers, it was absolutely the norm to freely exchange uh, information, including software programs, the programs that are at the basis of running computers, the operating systems. That is how it was with the Unix operating system that uh, people could copy, compile, and run on their own computers. And in the 80s, uh, the Linux alternative or variant uh, was born for personal computers inspired by Unix in, in an open manner, and Linux became extremely popular. So popular that today's uh, internet couldn't exist without Linux. It is at the basis of uh, the Macintosh operating system, of iOS, of uh, um, Google and Facebook and Twitter and the servers of cloud uh, uh, systems that we use uh, every day. It is basically everywhere. It was so successful that uh, there are now 
platforms with hundreds of thousands and millions of programmers storing uh, open source projects. And those platforms that do nothing but facilitate the storage and the coordination of uh, programmers uh, between them have become uh, valuable enough for, uh, in a bit of irony, Microsoft acquiring GitHub, one of the leaders of these uh, platforms, for several billion dollars. As a further demonstration of uh, the victory of open source uh, software, last year IBM acquired Red Hat for $34 billion, and Red Hat was one of the first commercial Linux uh, providers. Companies that uh, would uh, compile Linux in a usable form, uh, create uh, uh, in-depth uh, documentation, provide uh, training and installation services, technical support, and so on and so forth. And today, one of the biggest names uh, in the history of um, information technology felt that they should base their future with the largest acquisition they made ever on uh, acquiring this uh, uh, open source uh, uh, software company, Red Hat. In hardware, similar dynamics are, are playing out. On one end of the spectrum, there are car makers or makers of uh, um, farm equipment, tractors, and, and so on, that are obsessed in tight vertical control of not only their machine, the re uh, repairability of the machine too. You cannot bring your car to any dealer or let alone blasphemy attempt to repair your car yourself. It must be brought to an authorized dealership that paid a lot of money to buy the equipment that can communicate uh, with your car and they agree Yes, I am the car of that brand. You are the repair machine of that same brand. I allow you to, to, to repair me. And uh, if that uh, dialogue is not uh, uh, completed, or uh, if um, uh, the, the, the maker of the car thinks that uh, the car uh, is attempted to be repaired with uh, something that is not uh, officially sanctioned, uh, there can be legal consequences. Imagine if your tractor bro broke, you paid it um, a large amount of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and uh, uh, the uh, official uh, dealership um, repairing your tractor is too far, they cannot come for a week. Are you letting your crop uh, rot in the field because you are not legally allowed to repair uh, your tractor. That is the situation we are in with closed source hardware. But there is also open source hardware. That doesn't mean that uh, uh, just like with software, I can copy your hardware uh, and in a similar way to software, we will both have it. Maybe in the near future with 3D printers becoming ever more sophisticated, really advanced uh, features, uh, maybe even electronics, can be printed. And then duplicating hardware on the fly will mean that if I want to have it and leave it to you as well, you don't need to sell it to me or to rent it to me. You don't need to uh, be without if I want to steal it. Uh, you can have it and I can have it at the same time. But in the meantime, what is happening until we get there is that open source hardware companies are freely sharing the designs, the list of components, the list uh, of uh, instructions on how to put the hardware together. A very successful open source hardware company was founded in Italy by Massimo Banzi and the name of the company is Arduino. Arduino uh, brought back uh, 40 years later uh, the uh, joy of tinkering uh, that disappeared with the extreme integration of electronics components. Um, it was hard before Arduino for somebody 
without specialized tools and very advanced knowledge to uh, create, uh, for example, little sensors for Internet of Things uh, uh, applications or experiment with parallel computing where a task could be distributed across uh, multiple processors and many, many other things that today are possible thanks to Arduino, which has become very, very successful. So, what does have this to do with COVID-19? Well, a lot of the equipment that uh, hospitals and patients, uh, people sick with COVID-19 need today uh, is available uh, in quantities that are absolutely insufficient. And of course, some things are fairly elementary. We are told how to uh, uh, how to uh, sew uh, our own masks, and that is fine. But there are other things like the ventilators and the respirators and many other medical devices that uh, are tricky and delicate and important, life-saving, but still not available in sufficient numbers. My son Cosimo was a member uh, of a Facebook group, Open Source Medical Devices, there were less than 2,000 members in the group only uh, two, three months ago. Now the group has 100,000 members and it is translating the documentation of the open source medical devices that frantically uh, this community is collecting, analyzing, implementing, testing and producing, often with uh, 3D printing technologies. Uh, the translation of the documentation alone, uh, coordinated by another friend of mine, uh, David Devert, uh, is happening in almost 70 languages as we speak. This is a beautiful example of a global collaboration that is creating tremendous value, saving lives, and guaranteed it is going to be the basis of an, a, a very large number of new startups creating value. They will create value the way that Rat Hat creates value uh, that uh, was uh, uh, that became worth uh, tens of billions of dollars. They create value the way Arduino creates value. And the community benefits with the acceleration of knowledge that derives with a more enlightened view of how we can optimally uh, uh, benefit both uh, the inventors, but also society uh, uh, in a, a positive collaboration. So thank you very much for uh, watching this week's uh, The Context. I invite you to become a supporter on Patreon at patreon.com slash David Orban, and I will uh, welcome you to the next episode of The Context next week.